Uh, yes, we are live now. Please start. Thank you. And so, so good evening to everyone. And, and uh, thanks for joining on a, a Thursday evening. So, so we are a group from Walmart. Uh, thank you, IT Madras, for inviting us and, and, and uh, having us do this, this uh, session on, on uh, retail. So my name is Ravi Balas Brahmanian. So I lead uh, customer data science in, in uh, Walmart Global Tech India. So we have a, a good, good a group of, of a panelists. Uh, and, and we are also touching a, a very, very interesting topic. I think most of you are, are familiar with, with retail because of the way you actually shop. And because of our size, we also being, like say, number one fortune company, and, and, and there is also a scale to, to what we do in, in retail, so Walmart. And, and, and I think that the, the way we have set up the session is we have invited uh, a few of our senior data science directors from, from different, uh, like say, application areas as well. So we have Nataraju from our marketplace team, Shantala from our supply chain team, and then Subhashesh from our international team. So the, the intent is just to, uh, uh, to to give you a breadth of, 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 of and a flavor for, for the kind of, of uh, AI applications uh, that you will actually see in retail through the lens of marketplace or supply chain optimization, or even international, uh, like say, if I'm working across multiple markets in international, so how that will work. So I think that's the, the way we have structured the session. So welcome, Ishantala, welcome, Natu, welcome, uh, Subhashish. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Shantala, you want to, to take a few minutes to, to introduce yourself to the group here? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, really excited to be here. First off, you know, the, the energy from, from the youth and, and students is always a, you know, inspiring thing for us. So I'm uh, Shantala, as, as Ravi already mentioned, I've uh, been at Walmart for a couple of years now. Uh, and I've been a technologist for far longer, about two decades or more in this field. Uh, working on a wide spectrum of industries, uh, quite spent quite a significant part of my um, uh, career in telecommunications, building real-time uh, distributed event-driven systems, um, made the foray into data science, uh, latter part of my career, and, uh, you know, uh, built uh, AI and ML solutions for the finance industry and automotive. And at Walmart, I'm, I'm heading a couple of teams. We are doing a lot of... Um, uh, supply chain related uh, problem solving, primarily in, in two key areas, right? One is, you know, you build uh, solutions that make use of science to improve existing solutions, or you're doing some greenfield innovative solutions that are, that are scientific, that are based on science. So um, never a dull day, um, you know, it's, it's been phenomenally exciting, I would say. So any students out there, you feel like, you know, you, you have boring moments or dull moments, come talk to Walmart. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Shantala. It's a great interaction. Natu, you want to go next? Yes. Uh, thanks, Ravi. Uh, thanks again, ITM, uh, for the opportunity. Uh, looking forward to, you know, uh, answer some of the questions uh, maybe some of the students have. Uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, I've also been in Walmart uh, for like a little more than a year and a half. Uh, in Walmart, uh, my main role is to uh, help sellers grow their business. Uh, I think most of you are familiar with marketplace, uh, you know, uh, companies like Flipkart, uh, which is there in India, which do this uh, marketplace business, right? And uh, what I'm doing uh, in my day-to-day -day life is to use data science and AI-based uh, uh, technology to give some kind of a decision assist uh, tools to the sellers so that they know which products they should sell, which products are customers looking for and which products they have to market. So everything to do with how sellers can grow their business. Uh, in addition to it, I also saw a lot of problems uh, with respect to how do we reduce operation costs for running marketplace. Uh, maybe I can talk about a couple of examples uh, uh, later. Before joining Walmart, uh, I was uh, more in the auto industry. Uh, so I was with uh, Bosch, where I was solving more 
problems around autonomous driving. I think uh, most of you must be familiar with autonomous driving. It's still not a reality, but uh, uh, in a lot of exciting stuff uh, in my past and uh, as well. I'm a mechanical engineer uh, by, let's say, education. Uh, so uh, long time back, I did thesis more in terms of solving partial differential equations uh, using uh, discontinuous caloric methods. So I kind of transitioned from, let's say, those kind of world to uncertainty and statistics. And then now, you know, we call AI, uh, right? So that's a little bit of uh, my background and looking forward to the rest of the uh, hour. There is one more PDE guy in the mix. Good. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Natu. Good, good. So, Vashish, so you want to go next and introduce yourself? Sure, sure, Ravi. Uh, well, thanks, IITM, for, of course, having us over and uh, offering us this opportunity to share our perspectives. Um, so, let's start a bit about uh, where I come from. Uh, my first brush with data sciences was maybe 17 and a half years back. Um, I was actually studying economics. I did my master's in economics, and uh, I remember dabbling in econometrics, which was uh, which is really the application of statistics into economic theory. And back in the day, we were trying to understand, you know, what are the key determinants of uh, consumer spending behavior? Was it income? Is it certain other geodemographic factors and so? And um, starting off, uh, we used to use, of course, regression models. Those still remain the workhorse techniques that we use in data science. Um, one classic misadventure, I remember, is trying to predict stock prices using time series forecasting methods. Never worked out, won my hands, but I learned lessons, good lessons out there. Um, 15 plus years in the data science industry, um, I started doing data sciences in the personal computing space, moved on to doing data sciences in marketing and advertising, had a short stint as a statistician in reinsurance. And then I found my home at Walmart. Um, been with Walmart for seven and a half years now. Um, I am part of the Walmart International Organization, a director of data sciences in global tech. And um, my team works across a diverse set of international markets. Uh, Ravi was briefly alluding to it. So we really cater for customer needs across markets like Canada, Mexico, Chile, South Africa, China, et cetera. And um, we work across the spectrum of retail, right? From uh, how we source goods, so how we use the supply chain to how we create enriching customer experiences and so forth. Uh, my team creates machine learning solutions for across all of these spectrums. Um, you know, in a nutshell, I'd say I, I was an econometrician who kind of evolved into a statistician, who evolved to a data scientist. And now I'm more of an evangelist for data science. So, and the evolution, I suppose, will go on. But very happy to be part of this panel and looking forward to contribute my two cents. Back to you, Rav. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Subhashish. I think the back to, to at least the, the, the larger student group is you, at least you are going to actually interact with, with a group of people with, with diverse backgrounds, plus also working on, on uh, different application areas as well. I think because whenever I hear market, at least in Chennai, people will always relate to that Coimbatore market going there and trying to actually check the vegetables and, and, and trying to choose between buying tomatoes from the guy on the left or guy on the right or whatever, right? But when you're trying to do online market, it, it's actually different. How do you search for things? How do you enable things? How do you, when somebody comes and search? So, so Natu, I know in in marketplace, can you list like say some some problem area or some some an application area that we are trying to to help sellers with with uh, like say a data science solutions and then give people a feel for for a problem and then and, and expand on it. Sure. So let's start. Let me start with uh, customers. I think uh, as all of us are quite familiar that you know uh, the one thing which makes us uh, choose from uh, one company to the other is speed of delivery, right? Uh, I was just talking uh, to my daughter the other day and uh, she wanted to buy a digital clock. And then uh, I was looking for it and uh, you know one of the apps said three days and the other said two days and she's like, I want to go with this app because you know it's like delivering in two days. So, one of the really big challenge uh, for marketplace uh, is how do you predict the time it takes for delivering an item, right? 
because traditionally if you look at walmart we own the inventory of a particular product and it's very easy uh, because you know we control the logistics and the flow to a large extent and you can predict with certain certainty when a particular order will be delivered but with marketplace we're kind of opening uh, the platform to lots of different type of sellers so how do you predict when a particular seller will deliver a particular item to a particular geographic region uh, across vast country right let's say us so that's a fairly uh, you know uh, interesting and a difficult problem and uh, we try to solve it uh, by applying uh, you know uh, machine learning and data science uh, based uh, methods uh, so what we do is even before a item is ordered by somebody we do a lot of uh, uh, you know number crunching to figure out uh, which combination of sellers items and uh, geographic region can be served within next day or within two days or within you know three days or uh, more and this kind of uh, unlocked uh, a lot of uh, potential for items uh, to be discovered in marketplace so it's like a win win for everyone right sellers are happy customers are happy because uh, there it brings a little bit of a predictability of when their order uh, will come in spite of lot of uncertainties around it so this was one large scale problem we solved and this kind of really made lot of impact uh, within uh, walmart very nice i think we did this we have a name for it as well in in in, in yes. it's fairly uh, marketed uh, as well it's called uh, smart delivery tags so okay. you kind of uh, uh, you know uh, like a smart tag to tell when a particular item will be delivered is it two days or one day or three days very nice, very nice. so good 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 i think this is relatable to to everyone that the example you gave in in, in in i think the the way e-commerce kind of got defined is it's one is of course free shipping and then the speed of delivery and 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 and, and, and now we are also seeing apps I think people have have uh, we have not tried it at that 15 minute delivery and then within 30 minute delivery so you are also going to the extreme mile of like say not walking to my gate as well and and, and, and having someone come to our home from the the local kirana as well but good good thank you natu subhashish i think the, i always get uh, very very fancied with subhashish because of the diverse variety of applications he does because one day he talks uh, in French, the next day in Spanish, the third day in Portuguese, and 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 because we have stores across each of these countries, and 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 and, and the Walmart philosophy is we have EDLP, what we say, everyday low prices. It is across wherever we we sell, right? But but there is also a local nuance to, to each market that we actually bring. So I think in 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 data science and applications as well, right? So so you have to still cater to local. But ideally, if you want to build that scale, you want to do it holistically. So how do you, can you list examples or can you bring some some problem how you, we are actually doing local, but also approaching it from, from, from a broader, like say one one solution perspective or, or, or can you give? Sure, sure. But before that, yes, we, we do get to speak a lot of languages but a data scientist like maybe Python or PySpark the most, <laughs> just to <laughs> make a joke out of it. But yeah, I mean, thanks for bringing that question up. Uh, it'll be very pertinent for us. Um, I'll probably take one uh, use case. Um, so the Walmart International team um, really takes care of customer needs, like I said, across different markets, Canada, Mexico, Chile, China. And of course, um, they differ you know, in multiple ways. Language just being one abstraction of it. Right. Um, but if uh, Walmart has to act like a truly international retailer across all these markets, it needs to create this unified view of items across all across these markets. Think of it as a sort of unique identifier across all of these markets, right? That helps you understand the kind of the same items being sold across all of these geographies. Well, how does it help? It helps in multiple ways. If you can do that, um, then one can really buy in bulk across these different markets, which means that we reap in a lot of uh, economies of scale, which of course means that we can buy, um, you know, at a slightly cheaper cost, which in turn means that we can keep uh, the item prices lower, offer them uh, at lower prices to our customers, which uh, goes with our motto of, right, of uh, helping our customers save money so that they can live better, 
as we call it, everyday low price. Um, now, this has uh, obvious challenges. The, the most obvious one, perhaps, is the item names can be in uh, different languages, one in Spanish, one in Chinese. Um, you know, items back in um, Canada and the Quebec region could be in French as well. So you never know. That's just one. Um, item names can be abbreviated. They can be misspelled. There can be a whole lot of item categories that you need to deal with. And uh, all this makes it very difficult for um, mere human intervention or human experts to solve this problem. We, this needs to happen across scale, across all of these markets, right? So here's where uh, you know machine learning sort of comes in to save the day. We actually build a machine learning a solution that's heavily driven by uh, state-of-the-art uh, natural language processing models, which kind of standardizes the item hierarchy all of these markets and gives this view to our associate procurement and merchandising partners. And that again enables them to bulk, you know, buy in bulk and kind of reap those benefits of scale. So yeah, that's one example that we have. Good, good. Thank you. So I think across, so, so we do then then leverage quite a lot of natural language models that the way you are actually building some of the stack and then, and, uh, yes, yes, we do. We will talk about it. Good, good. The, I think Natu bought a good one, which probably relates to, to you, Shantala, is he brought a use case or he explained an application smart tag that is tied to, to, to logistics. And then he's also doing an optimization exercise between sellers as well so, so being our our kind of in-house supply chain expert so so, so can you at least pick us or, or, or ex tell us uh, let's say a problem area that, that you are handling on a daily basis i think the i think a lot of people the heart of walmart in in, in a sense is actually our supply chain network so we yeah. have just yeah. in us we have 5500 plus stores and and, and like, so there's a heavy movement of 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 items goods and then i'm just just saying stores which are customer facing then we do have what we call fulfillment centers we have distribution centers that act as hubs spokes and then quite a lot of like say uh, like handling happens inbound outbound and stuff so so shantala to you yeah absolutely ravi right i think uh, that is also one of the key differentiators and strengths for walmart where we have you know 5000 odd stores and then you know hundreds of warehouses and we are doing, you know, we want to give the customer the seamless experience of going from shopping in the store and, you know, to, to what uh, Shubhashish was alluding earlier, you know, th there should be no difference between if you're shopping, going, walking into a store or walking, you know, uh, sitting at home and clicking on your, um, on, on the walmart.com website. Um, but what really makes this complex in terms of um, you know, enabling that is really like you alluded to it, the backbone of the supply chain. It's, it's really all these systems that comprise um, the the logistics and managing this entire network, right? So in, in supply chain parlance, we call it the multi-echelon network, where you have, you know, warehouses all the way from, um, you know, these huge import DCs where we're getting goods from all over the world, consolidating them. And we have a hierarchy of nodes within our network where each one has has a certain you know it, it's tuned for doing certain functions and it's all about getting the right items at the right time to the right place so we satisfy the customer needs and what um, happened especially during the covid time period is that the expectations of of, of and the user experience has you know it's it's raised the bar quite significantly um, you know, a, a large amount of availability, faster speeds, right? We, we want it within a day, we want it sub hours uh, and uh, the large assortment, especially, right? So those are some of the challenges that the supply chain backbone needs to deal with, right? First is, um, you know, we typically look end to end and, and the very important thing that we start off with is of course the customer. And what makes some of the problems extremely complex is essentially, um, the stochasticity, the stochasticity that is inherent in supply chain, you know, customer demand patterns, supplier lead times, and then things that we that are under our control, but then there are lots of stochasticity, even within, you know, the, the inventory placements and pretty much every step through your multi echelon network, you can see that complexity. And the second factor is the scale at which Walmart operates. Uh, if we talk about forecasting for customer demand, we are literally doing billions of forecasts every week. Right? And, and that's just unimaginable scale. Um, regarding specific problems, I would say 
one of the interesting ones that we worked on very recently, of course, has to do with, uh, you know, how do I bring in uh, quick changes into such a humongous network, right? So we have a simulation platform where we do a lot of these kinds of experiments. And then, of course, there's the optimization, the last mile delivery, so you can get things faster to the users. And at, at a, uh, I would say at, at a much more futuristic scale, you know, what should my network look like, right? What, what does the future bring to us? How do we evolve this network where it's it's a combination of optimization solutions and traditional uh, you know machine learning approaches wonderful thank you shantala i think for for folks when we say last mile delivery this is our our last like say what we call the 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 last point before uh, that it actually reaches you and i think i have actually seen the, the big basket one's very, very close to home. So whenever my wife orders, hey, we, we, we missed paneer last time. Oh, don't worry. In an hour, we will have it for, for dinner or something. I think most people are, 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 I think there is an underneath engineering algorithm and a data science algorithm that is actually running in each of the, these, uh, like say, retailers that helps them at least uh, decide or plan so that they should actually locate certain facilities to actually help elevate the, 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 the one is the, the, the time to distance and time to actually reach the customer. Thank you, Shantala. Right. Thanks for explaining that, Ravi. No, no. Good. I'm actually, maybe this is a question. I don't think none of the students should answer, but I believe, I think last week or a few weeks back, there was a huge news I'm still seeing in, in, in magazines on, on uh, chat GPT-3, where hey, there is a new one by the open AI. And, and, and uh, I know we had some of our engineers like say asking it some questions on can you type Python code or, or PySpar code? It was actually they said hey the code actually did, did made a decent sense and 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 I'm actually interested in the student population because if you now do virtual quizzes right they can now, now open the GPT three online and 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 use it like an open book of like say check for for did I type the right answer or wrong answer or or, or. there is no 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 more to it to the to the faculty there is one more way of like say learning or one more knowledge to think of them that way. In, 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 but, but what drives chat GPT-3 is it's NLP, NLU models in a large scale, right? Uh, so, so Natu, this is one I want to, to, to ask you is, I know in Walmart, we do conversational AI bots, we do have a Converse platform. And, and, and so for this group of students, can you talk about how the, these bots work within Walmart and like as students from an NLP, NLU, what kind of skills they need to pick up as well? Sure. So, yeah, I think uh, chat GPT kind of uh, opened, uh, you know, imaginations of many people, right? Like, uh, uh, it's very interesting to play around with it. Uh, uh, within Walmart, I think uh, we do probably a lot more serious uh, stuff or let's say more uh, interesting stuff with respect to uh, three main areas, I can think. One is uh, shopping, customer shopping. So instead of you going and uh, browsing a particular item and then, uh, you know, figuring out which item you want to choose in it and then add a particular item. So uh, it can be uh, super simplified by talking to a chatbot. Sim something very simple like, uh, hey, add paper towels uh, to my basket, right? But the cool part is what some of these systems will do is they first understand what you're uh, typing but they also understand your uh, preferences based on historic uh, uh, transactions you have done, right? And they know exactly when you say paper towels, which brand are you referring to? Uh, and, you know, which probably th thread count, uh, all those things, right? Is it going to be two or is it going to be five? So those kind of things are thought through and then, you know, the answer comes. A uh, couple of other areas where we use a lot of chatbots, again, you can also think of it more like a, voice to uh, let's say text to uh, reply it uh, is uh, in the area of um, uh, customer care automation all of us at some point of time would have dealt with hey where is my order or uh, i'm not happy uh, with the order uh, or some questions around it right so lots of these things are also answered by bots again you can think of walmart scale where there are millions of customers who are buying orders or who are trying to buy something. So lots of these things get ordered, uh, get answered uh, via some of these uh, conversational uh, chat machines. 
the other uh, probably not so marketed area but is also very very useful within walmart is uh, uh, how do we help our associates uh, be it store associates or the drivers for example who are uh, delivering uh, particular items uh, we also have a app uh, which the store associates and the drivers uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, use to kind of uh, figure out uh, which is an order that they have to pick for or uh, which is the next delivery that they're doing so all those kind of things so in a nutshell uh, walmart uses a lot of these uh, chat uh, uh, based uh, systems right uh, for customers for internal let's say associates uh, store associates and uh, so that you know it, the experience for all these uh, stakeholders become very very smooth and makes the life better yeah then good good thank you hinatu so all of this is for i think if, 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 at least if there are students listening in these are actually we what we listed are actually application areas but the, the stack that is actually driving us is if you are actually doing classes courses on natural language processing nlu and and like say do doing like say uh, text mining related stuff just to to do add a, a, a an extra detail yeah. um, thank you natu uh, i think the we are because we are covering certain breadth of problems right i think the one that is across i don't think retail but but the world is actually no what's next and this is where it's always challenging but but we are it's bread and butter forecasting is actually not new i think people have been trying to do forecasting solutions for for quite long it's 30 plus year old but it is a need of the ever as well it is a necessity as well in in right because we want to at least i think in in walmart we try to do forecast next week next four weeks or next 26 weeks as so we we have just to, to do long term planning short term planning and stuff and a lot of times forecasting provides some inputs it has to be combined with with optimization as well because end of the day you are making planning decisions and it's nothing is always we always operate in, 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 in a gray area or you have to make choices and in, 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 i think the and, and shantala from and i know a lot of this is in some sense time series modeling and optimization algorithms right so for, for okay. students can you then touch on this area of forecasting and optimization and then expand in, in the way how we actually do certain things and, and, and what kind of skills they can kind of like say pick up as they kind of like say yeah yeah absolutely absolutely so uh, you know forecasting like you said especially you know customer demand forecasting is is the bread and butter for pretty much any business out there that, that deals with customers and um, as i earlier alluded to this right just want to emphasize what makes it really complex at walmart is really the stochasticity that's inherent in it and then, of course, the scale at which we operate, right? Um, so um, regarding what kind of technologies are we using, um, it's, it's really a whole spectrum of, uh, you know, modeling types, right? All the way from simple, um, you know, simple, your, your single exponential smoothing, uh, combinations, ensembles, to all the way to deep neural networks um, that, we, that we make use of. And also, uh, what makes it really interesting, just from a student perspective, is really you know what you what you called about Ravi, right? We don't do forecasting for the sake of forecasting, right? Forecasting is really driving the downstream business business decision, and the choice of say even your error metrics that you choose in order to evaluate what is the right forecasting algorithm, what is the right you know what's the right measure of accuracy, etc., is really driven by the business problem. So if I were to, you know, advise somebody who's who's wanting to come into the industry, first is of course, you know, you learn your fundamentals, right? You essentially learn the basic techniques, and then what really makes it, you know, go from there to actually applying it in a place like Walmart is really start from the business problem that you're trying to solve, right? What is the forecasting really aiming to solve for, and. Um, and then, you know, um, I, I think the next step from there would be, you know, you pick your error metrics, right? Because that, that drives the rest of it. And at Walmart, especially in a supply chain context, uh, we really want to use the forecasting results to drive some of the replenishment decisions. But what I mean by replenishment is really, how do I bring the right kind of inventory to the right, you know, to the right places by the right time in the right quantities, right? That's what my forecast is driving. 
And so that is where it ties into an optimization problem because this is an NP-hard problem, right? Everything downstream from there in terms of saying, what are the right set of nodes? What, what is the quantity? How do I allocate it in the face of constraints, real life constraints, right? We only have so much of supply. We only have so much of time within which to do it. We have only so much of capacity at the nodes. So all of these are real life constraints and, and it becomes a combinatorial optimization problem. Um, so that's that part of it. So you, you have to look at the forecasting in its entirety in terms of what problem is solving. It's not just a point forecast. The second thing which we have learned over the past two years, given you know, the, the larger macroeconomic conditions in the world is uncertainty, right? Um, and so we are now moving from to a, to a world where we are no longer sufficient to just have one value coming from a forecast, which is typically your average value, right? And you know, by the law of averages, making decisions on that is no longer sufficient in this uncertain world. So now we're looking at probabilistic forecasting you know, adding an uncertainty to it. And then of course that, that, in, that segues into, okay, now I do have a probabilistic forecast. How does my business adapt, my downstream systems adapt to using this kind of an uncertainty? Um, and I would say in terms of going beyond what you learn in school, it's thinking about a hierarchy of forecasts, right? Um, so sometimes we want to make decisions at the, at the entire market level, US level, or sometimes we want to make it at the state level. Sometimes we want to make decisions at the product, you know, entire set of products. So it's about, you know, doing hierarchical forecast and then, you know, coherent forecast, you know, once I do this hierarchy, how do I aggregate, disaggregate, right? So these are all some of the things that you apply in the industry, you might not necessarily learn in school. So my suggestion to folks who are interested in pursuing this as a career option would be go, go out to, you know, say something like Kaggle where companies are releasing data and as an example, Walmart did it, you know, there's a series of competitions called M, M series. Last year, uh, the last one, which was M5, uh, Walmart, in fact, shared uh, its, its actual store data, right, for, for a whole set of products across a whole set of stores. So that would be a good starting point for you to see, because you see the real, real, real world data is, is very messy. Uh, and you, you're not going to see a time series where every day or week you actually have a value, right? You're going to see something like, you know, I have I sold a quantity five five units of something, and then over the next six weeks it's zero 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 zero, right? So how do you build a model that can actually work with these kinds of series? Because this is what you see in the real world. Uh, and of course there are there are you know lots of uh, I would say combination techniques are the key to solving something like this, right? So Ravi, I think I got a bit overexcited. And, and... Good. No, this is very good. No, you covered quite a lot of things that is very, very relevant and applicable to, to, to students. And, and I think you also brought in the end, right? The, the way when I look at the time series, I don't see continuous orders. I don't see me going and buying. And I think this is where what happens is we as customers kind of like say we also play a role because when I choose to buy, when I go to buy, do I buy only once a week or, or do I buy, like say, every day? And, 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 and we are, again, also slowly moving into what we call traditional, we walk into a store and buy versus the, the, what we call the Omni, or our order through online and order through. And, 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 and most retailers are, are, are also now, now slowly evolving into a customer. We, we have always been a customer-centric company. Now, through through because of e-commerce and online, that, that focus is also, it's like a, like now, now many, many, it's like a bright light. So this is where we now, now slowly get into personalization, recommendation. Can I incentivize people or can I now kind of like say, nudge people to actually buy certain things. And, and, and so there are recommendation algorithms. When I go to a site, I get a list of like, say, what do I want to, the list of preferable things or recommended products. And, 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 and so, so underneath this also, there are data science algorithms that is, powering it because i think if you go to flipkart and then search for whether it is just a battery or a toothpaste or, or, or something more fancy right you, you you do get a list of of like say across price ranges across brands and, and then based on your prior shopping preferences or based on certain other attributes so i think i want to to i think and uh, subhashish was mentioning in his i think part of his career i think he has worked on all the different data science areas we are talking today and, and, and he also mentioned personalization as actually oh, one such area. So, so, so Subhashish, you want to maybe uh, 
talk on like say recommendation algorithms or or like say underneath like like an e-commerce website how personalization we be do and then just a flavor or hint of it sure 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 Ravi. so um you know personalization algorithms are um kind of staple uh, bread and butter in in e-commerce setups and they are used to come out with tailored recommendation typically tailored recommendation of items product to customers uh, based on their previous interest based on their previous purchase patterns and so forth and um they can use different kinds of data sources it could be the previous uh, you know, browsing behavior previous history of item bought and so forth uh, but overall what it helps is it comes up with this very tailored um you know delightful experiences personalized experiences for the end customer and obviously that leads to more engagement for the customers right now, um, again, as Shantala spoke of, understanding the business use case is, is paramount and the choice of algorithms will be dictated by that. Um, but very broadly speaking, there are, you know, three flavors of recommendation algorithms. Uh, one is collaborative filtering, where we typically look at past uh, user item interactions, what the users have bought, right? And um, create sort of a matrix out of it, user item matrix and come up with recommendations basis that. Uh, the second variant is content-based methods where we lay focus on the characteristics, if you may, um, you know, of the items or of the customer, and then come up with recommendation spaces that. Um, just to add on here that, you know, these content-based methods are slightly more robust to circumstances where we have new users coming, which is very classic in e-commerce setups. It's called the cold start problem, right? And uh, content-based methods kind of help us get to recommendations in these circumstances. Um, now, then there's a third variant which kind of combines the best of both these worlds and they are called hybrid methods right and these are much in vogue now i mean um, they range from simple methods um, which kind of ensemble both to at the far end of the spectrum using deep learning deep neural networks based uh, solutions um it depends again on the user needs right uh, the way that we architect the solutions uh, as to um you know stuff that students can pick up here of course Knowing the fundamentals of these three variants would be very helpful. Um, as it is the case with many other machine learning solutions, uh, much of um, the workings of these are driven by linear algebra, right? So getting a good hang of things like matrix methods, matrix factorization techniques, and so forth will uh, put everybody in good stead to understand what's really happening under the hood, and you can really play around with the solution that way. And, and of course, um, there are a host of uh, open source uh, solutions available to use. Um, LightFM is one in Python, which is which is very popular. It is a very popular hybrid recommendation kind of system. Um, TensorFlow recommendation system in TensorFlow is again in much in vogue, much in fashion now. So choices abound, but I think getting the fundamentals is 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 more important than you know wading off into using the software. So yes, I they focus on that. Thank you, Subhashish. No, it's wonderful. I think you touched upon, I think so for students, one is it's, yes, know your math well, because when in data science, yes, it, there is, there is a lot of involvement of statistics and then maths. And then I think the linear algebra and numerical analysis, at least related to, to, to the way how, how algorithms are set up, we, we solve them. So gradient boosting and all, all gradient descent. And hey, I think they are, they, they do apply. If you want to go underneath and, and, and look at how actually you are doing um, a problem setup that is actually being solved, right? So that it is good to, 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 if you have more time and then and, and not just the programming, but there is the way that the, the, the problem is structured. When, when you look at the problem structure, some of this underlying math will, will kind of like say, will, will come out as well. And, and, and I think that's where Shantala brought up a Kaggle where you do have data sets now publicly available across different problem areas. And, 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 and it's not just solving the problem area, but also unpacking the problem area and the kind of like say algorithm you choose to solve it. So that will, will, will help as well. I think with, with this, I don't know, we are close to 40 minutes into the session. We can move into to uh, Q&A and then uh, to take questions from, from the, uh, the group as well. There is already, I see a couple of questions there. Uh, so maybe we can uh, start with you, uh, Shantala. There is one, one on, on, on supply chain they have actually uh, listed uh, uh, for supply chain based problems. Um, so are you reading it out, Ravi? Yeah. 
I am, I am reading it out. I have to wear my glasses. I will show my age now. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. In, 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 uh, the, I think that the question is, like, say, are you using traditional algorithms uh, stochastic otherwise, or we are also now slowly bringing in reinforcement learning based algorithm agents as well? Yeah, uh, I mean, absolutely a timely question, right? So I would say um, uh, we are exploring all of these. We do use traditional algorithms. Um, the the some of the issues that we face with traditional algorithms is is you know the, the exact solutions are where you start off with the right numerical optimization uh, in the optimization space. The uh, problem with some of those are just the the scale, right? We cannot have these problems say running on CPLEX or Groovy for days on end at the scale at which we operate. So we end up doing a lot of in-house uh, development of algorithms. We explore a lot of meta heuristics. Right, some some combination of they're all some combination of you know random search and hill climbing, for instance. And now we are you know making foray into um, you know reinforcement learning. Again, I think what needs to be really solved over there is solving for scale, solving for scale, and then dealing with the the stochasticity to to a large extent. But it absolutely you know we are definitely looking at reinforcement learning as one of those things. That that's the next step for Walmart because it is you know you know classic sequential decision making and a lot of things that we do in the supply chain backbone is really about doing the right decisions taking it in the rightly manner and then where RL I think brings in more value than just the traditional um, you know numerical optimization approximation algorithms your meta heuristics is really um, because our supply chain is is a humongous system right it's made of many 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 subsystems each have their own optimization goals. And where we are really looking to, you know, now as a next step, as, a, as an evolution for Walmart, is really how do we make all of these things work in coherence toward the same set of goals? You know, at the end of the day, we want this to be so cohesive. And one of the ways that, that we think is, is very promising is really using reinforcement learning for this, where there are independent agents, but, but at the end of the day, they are collaborating to a certain extent. In, in, your tech, in your traditional numerical optimization techniques, this is extremely hard to do at scale. So yeah, absolutely. But uh, you know, again, it's a nascent area. Uh, solving, for, you know, solving for scale, for, at the Walmart scale, is, I would say, at least from, from my team's perspective, it's the biggest hurdle we have to cross in order to make it applicable to industry. Thank you, Ashantala. I'm going by, by the list or the order the questions came. So, so be, be patient with us as well. I think Subhashish, I want to, to, to maybe uh, uh, have you take the next one. So uh, ML model, I think this is where model explainability, interpretability, interpretability and, and there's a whole area that actually comes, explainable AI. And the question is, ML models are like a black box. So have you actually faced uh, problems about it? How do you go about, like say, uh, explaining to actually stakeholders when you have a specific model result or something. Right, right. Interesting question. So, um, you know, um, think of challenges with any black box systems, right? Uh, not just machine learning, anything that is opaque. I think the principal challenge that comes in there is the trust factor. We do not end up on phase trusting such a system. Um, so the challenges often are uh, to ensure that the system is trustworthy. Um, I mean, the typical route is to first doubt it and then ensure that it's proved otherwise. And there are various methods to do this, right? Um, well, black box systems are hard to, you know, get a peek under the hood, right? What is it that's leading to the predictions by itself? Uh, and this is a well-recognized um, problem. It's well dealt with at this point in time. Uh, there is a whole separate field in machine learning called explainable artificial intelligence, XAI as we call it, and the offshoots of it called FATML, uh, fair and transparent ML, right? Um, I remember back in the day, there used to be um, things like LIME, local uh, model agnostic explanations, and now the involved thing typically is something called a SHAP or shapely value regressions, which help you really understand the contribution of the different factors that go into the model, no matter kind of how convoluted, non-linear your model is, kind of gets you there. But even if you do not use such, um, you know, sophisticated advanced methods, in any machine learning model, it's always advisable to put any kind of a guardrail around, right? Poke around the model, stress test the model, and this predates black box models. Back in the day, when even when simple linear regressions were the order of the day, uh, the idea was stress testing any models, 
and trying to see that do you um, get to see the model not behave as expected? Are the results counterintuitive? There's no um, other resolution to this than really understanding really the core of the business and um, understanding what the business users would also expect to see as the results. Right? And if you see that the results are, um, well, doesn't add about, um, they do not make sense, then you need to go on and revisit it. Right? And again, build on guardrails around it. So um, that's what I would say. I mean, it, it's always well advised that build guardrails around any of your models, black box or white box or not, and ensure you put that in place before it's kind of moved on to production. Thank you so much. We will maybe jump to a couple of student questions and then go back to, to I see a couple of technical ones as well. Uh, I think Natu, I... Rabi, I, I was just uh, thinking there is a question on the customer segmentation. Maybe you should take that. I will take that one. Yeah. The, the, there are at least three questions I see that are related. Like say, skills to get hands-on as a first-time data scientist as a, or as a fresher. Uh, to, to work in Walmart, what typical data science, MLA skill sets do you expect from a fresher? And there is also a question, hey, do you only look for people with deep learning, RRR, folks with NLP, NLU, RRR, traditional ML uh, knowledge background, is this sufficient? So these are, I think, interrelated questions. So can you maybe answer to, to the yeah. student group here? Yeah. So maybe on the skills part, uh, I would boil it down to uh, three things. One, I think uh, most of the panelists uh, mentioned it multiple times, get your math right. So it's not necessary that you understand all the algorithms in full depth, but make sure you at least uh, have a set of algorithms where you know exactly what is going behind fit dot model, right? Because a lot of times this is a, there is an abstraction in the code, which, uh, you know, you have few parameters and then, you know, it just does the magic, right? But uh, please make sure you understand what are the nuances, what are the hypotheses uh, behind, uh, you know, uh, for the model to work. So I would say the math uh, as a overall uh, umbrella, uh, please understand uh, that uh, uh, well. The second part is, uh, again, this is very big difference compared to uh, academics to uh, real world. I think Shantala alluded uh, to this multiple times is about the scale, you know. Uh, you might, uh, you know, get away with working with uh, a small problems, solving it on a probably personal computer, uh, you know, in the school, right? But when you come to, uh, you know, any enterprise, forget uh, Walmart, the data will just not fit uh, in your uh, single computer, right? So th there comes uh, understanding a little bit more programmatic uh, skills, uh, be it Python, be it Spark, how do you learn some of these things, master some of these uh, techniques uh, would really help. So, uh, you know, that's the program program uh, dimension. The third dimension, uh, again, this kind of changes uh, all the time is uh, the domain knowledge. So a lot of times what happens, you get a table, right? Uh, and then, you know, there are columns and uh, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, exciting or quite tempting to just forget about the name of the column and just start, uh, you know, playing with the data, right? Um, but what is important is, again, to understand the business problem and see if the whatever data you have is kind of, uh, you know, uh, will help solve the business problem, right? So the third dimension, I would say, is understand the domain well. So I can just give you my example. When I joined Walmart, I had no retail experience apart from being a retail customer, right? So I was always a customer, but you know, I didn't have so much of a domain knowledge. So I had to spend a lot of time to understand the nuances, understand the terminologies, understand, you know, uh, how to read the data to understand, uh, you know, the nuances uh, of it. So broadly, I would say these three skills uh, would really, you know, make you uh, like a superstar. Uh, if you can master all these three uh, equally well, the math part, uh, the programmatic part, and then the uh, domain knowledge uh, part. Uh, the question around, uh, you know, do I need to understand, uh, do I need to be, uh, be expert at NLP, image-based deep learning, reinforcement learning? Uh, if you can do great, uh, but if you can't, don't be overwhelmed, uh, I would say, because these are more like uh, various tools to solve a problem, right? I think uh, it's more important to uh, 
focus on understand the business problem, convert it into a mathematical problem, and then you know tools will uh, come uh, after that. Knowing it will be helpful. Uh, I think Shantal also said in the uh, in the starting. Uh, try your hands at uh, Kaggle, right? I think that's a very safe zone. You won't lose at all. And the good part is a lot of times you also get a lot of kernels, uh, which could be like a starting point for you to run your own experiments. So uh, try that. These days, uh, what I also personally do sometimes is uh, read a lot of papers, but papers come with code, right? Like papers with code. So this also kind of reduces the gap between you having like a PhD level knowledge to applying it in real world. So take some of this, uh, you know, uh, code, uh, try it around uh, with the real world data, and that will really set you up for success in whatever uh, you do. So hope some of these suggestions will really help you in, in your own uh, data science and uh, AI journey. Good, good. Thank you, Natu. It's wonderful. I think you covered all the parts nicely. So I think for maybe this will come in every fresher's mind is, hey, you are asking me to learn a domain. So what we mean by it is it's mainly be, be, be curious in, in, in because as a customer or as you actually look at things that are either because as, as you are a customer, as you are actually going and buying things, right? The, the curiosity part is how is underneath that that engine is actually driving or running. That's when the curiosity will take you to actually play with Kaggle data sets, play with touch the, the, the data that is actually being shared by, by some of the real companies as well. And, and, and I think that the... Anyway, just to, to, to add a one, one, one note there. Yeah, so, so one thing that I would like to add, right, to students, don't look at a, don't look at data as just, you know, floats in some, you know, bulls and, and whatever, right? There's behind every data set that's coming from the real world, there's a story, right? And what you really need to do is try to catch, you know, unravel the thread, you know, catch on to that story. Because like Natu said, I had a very similar experience, came into retail, didn't know anything. You just look at data as just numbers. It, it, really, you, you will build the wrong thing, right? Try to, try to get to the story that's behind the data. Let me tell you, every data set has a story behind it. And, and that's key to solving real world problems. Yes, yes. No, equally applies. I'm not a retail guy. I also... <laughs> probably caught on it three, two, three years back. I was actually an industrial manufacturing guy doing IoT stuff. So I think yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it, it's very, very fair. And, and uh, I think there are, I think we will maybe go to, to uh, I see the, I think, Shantala, there are a couple of questions coming to you. Maybe we will, I will let you take these ones. There is one related to, at least when you uh, mentioned prob probabilistic forecast with, with range and, and, and uh, and there is always end of the day when you actually, as a data scientist, produce a solution. There is also also you have to look at your end user, how they right. can actually consume. I think that's where right. somebody has a question on on on. Hey, how do you convince someone that this is actually a much much better approach than than point forecast? There is also one more that's kind of like say coming related to to uh, uh, handle stochasticity on on input parameters and stuff so maybe i will let you uh, take right. and then we will do the customer one yeah definitely i think uh, you know going back to how do you convince the customers that it's a better way to do it i think in walmart it just happened because of what what you know the the just organically the things that walmart went through right and this is happening i mean we had started on this journey you know even before all of the pandemic and and the larger macroeconomic uncertainty that we've been in for the last few years we had already started on a journey, but now it has just given so much more, I would say, you know, tying it back to reality. And so even folks that don't necessarily think about, you know, stochasticity as such, they, they understand, you know, where things are not sufficient anymore, point forecasts are not sufficient anymore, that they're just average values. So I think in, in enterprise settings, this knowledge has already kind of permeated through, through all of the uh, different groups, right? including the business groups. Um, one of the things that I would say is, again, the explainability is key. And always, you know, for, for especially from a business perspective, they don't necessarily are wowed by theory and math. They really just want to see the results, right? So what we do, especially in, in, in one of the things that my team personally builds is, is one of the platforms where, in fact, you can look at you know, you you run the you take the same data sets, you run it through an existing solution, you get the results, right? This is what everybody understands. 
you know, how much does it cost me to actually deliver this packet from, you know, this particular store to a user? And now you take this other thing that you think is, is, is all full of, you know, science and math based and doing all the right things theoretically, you implement that, you run it again, the same thing, you should show something better, right? In terms of your business metrics. That's one way of convincing, you know, without using any of the, the fancy language about stochasticity or uncertainty or confidence intervals, prediction intervals, just get this to work and show that it's better in terms of things that matter to the business. All right, so that's that's one part. Um, regarding, you know, how technically we are implementing, uh, say for instance, how are we handling stochasticity, the input uh, is essentially a lot of, um, I would say, um, you know, building uncertainty sets, building robust optimization on top of the uncertainty sets. Um, again, you know, these are hard to solve at scale. We also do a lot of hybrid kind of modeling, right? Sometimes it's it's dealt with in uh, traditional machine learning ways. We're also looking at a lot of advanced DNNs and within optimization space, it's using robust optimization. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, there are questions on at least career, whether it is internships or our jobs in Walmart. I think uh, uh, we would ask you to go to Walmart careers. I think Global Tech India, Walmart careers and, and and I think we do ask for for I think occasionally or I think there is there is ask for interns there is also open roles that is actually being published so you should be able to 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 apply directly there in our, our website whether it is the internships or or, or uh, jobs as well I think that that's the, I think that's the, the perfect landing page I think we, we do all our jobs are actually advertised on our our uh, Walmart.com so Global Tech India. Uh, and, and, and I know there is a question on customer segmentation. This is my area. We are also approaching to the hour. We will maybe get a few more questions and then we will kind of like say close the session. And, 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 and um, uh, let, let me read. Uh, uh, there are a few different ways we can actually do customer segmentation. So the simple one we, we typically start with is what we call an RFM based segmentation, what we call like say recency, frequency and monetary. So how recent does a customer shop with you? How frequently do they shop with us? And then how much they spend every time they, they, they shop? So, so based on it, that is a way we could kind of like say, segment our customers into two, two different, like say buckets. And that kind of like say, helps us capture the, the, the in some sense, I could say a loyalty of them to us. In, in like if somebody is shopping, on a weekly basis and then spending close to, to, to 500 rupees versus somebody shops on, on every three weeks, shops 100 rupees versus somebody shop three months back or six months back. So that, that is one way to kind of like say do segmentations. And there is also, there is one flavor of it based on transaction data. There is also, you can actually expand and then look at the, the, the brands they typically go and buy or, or, or the, the price range they actually go on and buy buy items or products within a certain category so so we could also do customer segmentation based on the, their their price preference ranges or our brand affinity and stuff and, and and we do do segmentations typically in a rolling period we we, we may start with certain period in time the, the reason we do rolling period is which it answers that the next question is our pattern changes kind of like say I used to buy maybe some brand of shoe when I was a grad student versus when I got my first job, I migrated to a different brand of shoe because you maybe made slightly more money or, 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 or we were single bachelors and then you recently got married or, or you were a student, you got a job. So all your pricing decisions, shopping patterns actually changed with respect to time because there is life changes happen. So introduction to family or all of that, right? So so if we know the customer, we are looking at the, their purchase patterns, purchase behaviors and changes. And then we do have a way to, 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 to look at, like say, uh, looking at the changes of their behavior in time and then see how we can sometimes incentivize them to actually looking at this purchase pattern to actually move up the, 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 the loyalty scale or who move, move up how much they, they spend with us and stuff. So, so that's how broadly I'm just in a nugget sharing details on, on customer segmentations. I know we are running over time, so we will pick, and there was a question on, on AI research, competency and stuff. So maybe Subhash is, I think in this lot, he has the longest tenure and then he may be a good guy to, 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 to also talk a little bit about, uh, uh, I think there was a question on that Walmart has its own AI research competency. In, 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 uh... um, now let me take, put it this way. We do not have a pure research competency, but whatever that we do, 
is more on the applied side of things. But again, if you look up and Shantala was pointing out to some of the instances, right? Many of these work that we do are greenfield engagements. They're, they're new areas which are almost begging for a solution, right? So innovation is also part and parcel of our DNA, right? So if you look around, you'd find us uh, represented at conferences. We often file for patents for the work we do. So in a way, um, you know, research innovation is, is not segregated to just a select set pool of people. It's, it's across, it's there internally across all of the teams that we work at, right, in global tech. That's the way that uh, we do things. So there is an econ buddy student. He is asking you. How, how did your your uh, economics background help you in in your uh, career in, in okay uh, well good to good to have a fellow uh, <laughs> student uh, it helped me in, in multiple ways i suppose um, you know one is um, well studying economics gives you that strong fundamentals in in statistics that's one of the things that comes with it right um, it lays the groundwork for some of the more fundamental um, algorithms that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, well, regression, I spoke of it. There's a whole bunch of other things that I can speak of as well. But, but you know, more importantly, what I felt is um, it kind of gives you the knack of asking uh, the why question. Why are we getting to observe a certain pattern in the data? Um, it makes a bit of the you know detective of sort, a Sherlock Holmes, if you, if you will, who goes back and asks those questions, interrogates the data, and comes out hopefully with a good story around it. Um, um, and again, um, Chandler put it really, really well that behind every number that we see is probably uh, a story, right? And uh, it's kind of begging to be told. We just need to go in, deal deep inside it, and come out and unearth it. So. I think um, you know being an econ graduate kind of helped me there to ask those right questions to unearth that story out of many of this interesting work that we do, and of course articulating this to the stakeholders. So yeah, I think that's the way that I would say it helped me a lot. Wonderful, thank you. I think this is maybe I will pick up this question and then maybe we'll open it up to whoever wants to answer as well. I think the this is a I think that this falls right in and on on on. Okay, I'm actually building. I think that I'm reading the question. I work on a biomedical device using AAML and, and, and deep learning for, for radiology. So, so I think they are detecting certain things. And, and, and we have an algorithm-based logic. And, and, and how do you no, 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 drive this, this machine-assisted or machine-based, like say, detection versus, like say, uh, the doctor providing a review? And, and I think this is where the, the nuance of, of trustworthiness are, 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 are of an A algorithm or I think it's that is one or, or even when we all talk about confusion matrix and accuracy this is actually a nice scenario that plays very well as well in terms of false positives true negatives and that's algorithm driven versus actually a doctor-based diagnosis right so it's not an easy question to answer so I will maybe open it up to 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 one of the folks here to actually uh, uh, pick up. So I, um, I can add a short perspective to this, right? Um, I would say, I mean, even, even though supply chain seems far removed from, say, doing, you know, life or death decisions, since, uh, such as in the medical field, where it, the stakes are much higher, um, we, we do face this issue, right? So one of the things that, that we do practically is... Um, when, when you need to adopt something that is that greenfield and innovative and there's a lot of human element comes into the picture, um, you build a solution such that it aids the human indecision in the initial phases, right? And you then, you gain the trust of the person who's using that tool, maybe in this case, it's a doctor or a nurse practitioner, whatever, right? Um, so there, there needs to be that synergist, synergistic start and then eventually you 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 the system the the machine also gets better because of the synergy right because you know there's the, although you know ml has been fantastic we've done you know leaps and bounds progress within the last decade there's still a long way to go in some of these areas right and so i think that this is a strategy even we we adopted even at walmart right they they're always don't don't discount human intelligence you know, bring about that synergy because there, there are lots of things that, that machines are not good at. And the, the way you gain the trust and confidence is making them work together. You know, where is it, where is the best use of the machine, right? It's it's in these fields, especially it's aiding the human. It's it's just 
helping them in things, doing the repetitive things, you know, crunching through, you know, trillions, terabytes of data, et cetera. And we do this at Walmart where we do allow the humans to override things that are done by the machine. Natu, you, you had to say something, please. Yeah, so I can just add, uh, I totally understand what you're saying, um, especially from my past experience. So it really depends on what is the lay of the land today, right? So we were looking at solving, uh, you know, diagnosis for diabetic uh, retinopathy. So what we were trying to do is we had a machine which takes an image of, uh, you know, the, the corona. And then uh, it kind of gives a diagnosis whether, you know, there is a potential for uh, diabetes for this patient. Uh, and it, it was a very, very important problem to be solved because if you can imagine, a lot of time the question is not uh, substituting a doctor, right? A lot of time there is no doctor available. Like if you go to rural uh, India or many places, uh, the process of diagnosing diabetic retinopathy, right, is very, very hard. So some of those places, uh, you know, probably uh, a assistance uh, to kind of at least uh, tell, uh, you know, uh, patients whether, you know, this is something which can be, you know, uh, go to further uh, level of detail. So those are some areas where I would say a lot of places, it's not about replacing a doctor. It's more like also what Shantala said, assisting a decision in between so that, uh, you know, the uh, the doctors can come in later and help. So that's a case in many areas where we solve as well. It's more depending on the use case, uh, you kind of design a solution according according to that. Good. Thank you very much. And I think we will probably will do one last question. I, I see them on the screen. I think the, the question on dynamic pricing also, I think uh, Subhashish has answered. Wonderful. There was one related to, to uh, uh, chatbot and then how we actually take, uh, like say, product ratings or our, our, our customer ratings and stuff, right? So maybe Subhashish, you can take this one and then we will uh, uh, wrap up. Sure. Um, it's just getting hang of the question. Um, like I can maybe repeat it. Does chat-based support get a lot more customer preference over human-based support? I would say the other way. Typically, we would like to have to talk to a human. But anyway, this is where scale comes and, 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 and there could be a tiered approach as well. I mean, but I will have Subhashish also answer. And then how much important customer-based product rating data is, is important? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll go with... Uh... Ravi, your pointer on the first one and the second one, um, you know, you do not always get ratings data. And there's a nuance to this, right? When you do get it, it's something that we call as an uh, explicit feedback by the customer. Uh, but um, we can always take a proxy of it, right? Uh, what is the customer's usage of items? What is the time that he has spent in a browsing session? Uh, going over items or categories that uh, oh. items comprise of, right? And you could probably draw some inferences of the customer's affinity from, you know, these sort of observations and the data itself. And they by themselves can also help, uh, you know, in coming out with item recommendations uh, for customers. So um, if you get rating data, that's great. But if it's not, there are multiple ways to work around uh, that handicap and come out with recommendations as well. Yeah. Good, good. Thank you. I know we, we, uh, we went over by, by 10 minutes. Thank you, Shantala. Thank you, Subhashish. Thank you, Nataraju. And thanks for, for the student community for, for listening to us for more than an hour. Thank you, Aishwarya, for, for arranging and giving us the opportunity. Thanks, uh, Ravi, for being a fantastic moderator. Um, absolutely. And, and the questions from the students have been, you know, definitely very insightful. Thank you. And, uh, best of luck for whatever you do. Stay curious. Uh, and uh, I'm sure this will uh, be uh, a good journey for you yeah. going forward. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. All the very best. Thank you. Thank you so much.